Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you here. I think you can you can hear me without the microphone, right? All right. Good to see everybody in this uh, seminar today. We have uh, uh, we are honoured by a visitor from uh, the Imperial College London, Dr. Robert Gross, who will talk to us uh, about uh, policy on energy. In fact, uh, the title of his talk, as you see, uh, is the cost of the intermittency, right? As, as he may tell us, uh, what about uh, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? What uh, is the cost of these uh, two important uh, renewable uh, energy approaches? So. And I'd like to mention that uh, Dr. Gross uh, is uh, one of the key players uh, in uh, energy analysis and policy in the UK. He is uh, director of uh, the Imperial uh, College uh, Center for Energy Policy and Technology. And also he is uh, co-director of the UK Energy Research Center. This is an important center in the United Kingdom, which uh, essentially issues uh, reports, uh, makes uh, comments, uh, uh, creates analysis for, uh, for the government of the UK to see and take, uh, take notice. So uh, uh, Dr. Gross is a reader at the Imperial College and he has uh, acted, he has participated uh, in uh, many endeavors that relate uh, to energy policy in the United Kingdom. And uh, I believe that uh, his uh, visit here with us at ISEN today is important because, as you know, this is what Eisner needs to always do, right? We visit and assess how we do our engineering. We need to do our engineering in a way that is compatible with uh, energy policy, right? Energy analysis as our own energy analysis division is uh, always trying to help us out to do, right? So I hope you will enjoy the presentation. And uh, Dr. Gross will be here to answer any questions you might have. Dr. Gross, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Petros. i just um, switch on this microphone. I think that's, oh. I think that's working. OK. Uh, so. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation uh, to come and, uh, and, and talk with you today. It's my, uh, it's my first time to visit uh, Kyushu. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I've had a fascinating day already visiting some of your labs and meeting with some of, uh, of your colleagues. Uh, and, and I very much hope that we can continue to have some interactions. Now, um, I'm going to start uh, with a, so a short introduction to Imperial College and uh, the UK Energy Research Centre. Um, it's a bit like the advert that you have to put up with at the start of a U YouTube uh, clip. So I apologise for the advertising on behalf of my employers, um, but they are my employers, so therefore I'll do their advertising. Um, actually, to be serious, uh, we have a, a, a very major uh, energy research uh, interest at Imperial College and in order to bring together all of the different people working on energy related topics across Imperial College um, we created the Energy Futures Lab uh, it was created I think in around about 2005 and it's been going uh, uh, for a long time it was first directed by a, a guy called Nigel Brandon Professor Nigel Brandon who I think he's quite familiar to many of you here uh, is a, a leading uh, 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 researcher in the fields of hydrogen fuel cells, uh, batteries and, uh, and so on. And uh, as you can see, we work across many different topic areas at Imperial and through the Energy Futures Lab. I'm not going to read them all out to you now. You can see, and I'm sure you're familiar with, some of those uh, kinds of topics. And I'm actually the Director of Policy at the Energy Futures Lab, and you can see my area of interest represented down there. It's, it's not so photogenic uh, as, as some of the other areas. So we, for our photograph, we just have a, a man standing at the podium. 
um, which is fairly meaningless. That man used to be the energy minister, or was one of our previous uh, ministers of energy uh, in the UK. Um, Petros also mentioned the uh, UK Energy Research Centre. Now, uh, in the UK, we don't have a national laboratory in the way that many countries do. Because whether it was a, a good thing or a bad thing, the national laboratories were large, largely closed in energy as a result of the privatization that happened in the 1980s and 1990s. So the closest equivalent we have is the UK Energy Research Centre, or UKIRC. And uh, I've been one of the co-directors of UKIRC since 2004. To, uh, UKIRC actually has its headquarters at Imperial College, but it's not actually just Imperial College, it's a consortium, and it runs across a whole bunch of the leading universities in Britain, and uh, it does lots of interdisciplinary whole systems research, it has a particular focus on policy, um, but uh, it also has a, 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 the objective of providing an opportunity for international engagement and so hence it could be a, of interest to to you guys if you're looking to engage with people in the UK. So what I'm going to talk about um, what I'm going to talk about this, this, e this afternoon this evening uh, is a report I brought a small number of copies with me of uh, something called the technology and policy assessment report on the costs and impacts of intermittency. And this is a, 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 a research theme, which is part of UKIRC, it's run by me. I've got a small team of researchers that work with me. And the objective of what we do is to provide independent, critical, policy relevant research on important topics. I think somewhere, here we go, so I've got the, um, this is the album covers from all of our greatest uh, hits. Uh, so you can see that over the last uh, 15 years or so we've, been, we've produced a very uh, large number and wide ranging series of reports. So we've covered everything from uh, is there a rebound effect in energy efficiency, if you improve energy efficiency do people use more energy, peak oil, uh, is there such a thing as uh, green jobs um, and a whole bunch of other uh, topics, critical metals. So I'm happy to talk about any number of different subjects. We've covered pretty much everything that you can think of. But the first thing that we did uh, back in 2006 uh, was we looked at the cost of integrating variable renewables. And so 10 years later, we decided to look at the cost of integrating variable renewables again. So what do I mean by that? I mean, how does integrating wind energy and solar in particular, into the electricity system, change the costs of the electricity system. Okay, so in order to understand that, why that's important, I'm just going to start with some context. So some of this might be really obvious to some of you, in which case I apologise, but I thought it was important to just start from why we decided to uh, do this work in the first place, why this has been very important in terms of its impact on policy uh, and why we decided to return to the subject uh, after 10 years and do the look at this topic again. Okay, so I'm talking about integrating renewables into electricity grids. Now I know that there are many people here that are interested for example in technologies that can be used for artificial, artificial fuels or for energy storage and so what I'm talking about is relevant to you but um, we need to think about the, the, the energy system as a whole uh, and we need to think more specifically about the, the operation of the electricity system so that we can understand these issues and understand these costs and impacts and so that's what we're trying, that's what we're trying to do but I just want to try and contextualise that and think about and just show that we understand how this all fits together. Okay, so this this is a fairly old slide. It's from 2010. It's a commonly used representation of the future. This one is from the IEA. This is from their uh, their, their I think it was the 
the, the blue map scenario. The blue map scenario is consistent with achieving climate stabilization, or was consistent in 2010, with achieving climate stabilization below 450 ppm. And you can see this is a, a, a fan diagram or a stabilization wedges, which is the term that was first um, made popular by um, uh, uh, Sokolo and Pakala uh, in Princeton. Uh, this idea that you have slices of stabilization. And I'm happy to talk about any and all of these because I've got interests and views in, in all of these. Um, and um, you know, this, the relative size of some of these wedges uh, will probably change if you were to do an optimization model now because the, the relative costs and our expectations of these technologies will have changed uh, in the intervening period. And actually one of the things which I've done a lot of work on, and which I'd also be happy to take questions about, is what we think we know about the future. How we make technology cost projections, why we get technology cost, cost projections wrong. And that's also an extremely important topic. It's not what I'm talking about this afternoon. I had to choose something, so I chose our most recent report. Uh, but that's the kind of global level context. And that's why some of you are working on CCS. And that's why some of you are working on you know, artificial fuels and there's a big focus on energy efficiency and so on. But I'm talking about renewables and I'm talking about the integration into grids. Now, I don't know how familiar uh, colleagues are with uh, the UK, but one of the things which the UK has had since uh, 2009 is a Climate Change Act and the UK's Climate Change Act is a legally binding obligation on the government to reduce CO2 emissions uh, by 80% relative to 1990 levels by 2050. So that's a very demanding target. I mean it's legally binding on the government I don't think anybody will go to prison in 2050 if the government fails to meet the target, but nevertheless, there is quite a rigorous institutional framework in, in, in place, uh, which involves something called the Committee on Climate Change, which advises the government on its progress in cutting emissions, and uh, also uh, recommends carbon budgets, for progress along this uh, trajectory towards uh, 2050. And I should say that the UK is already down, emissions are already down 41% on 1990 levels. Uh, now some of that progress is due to economic factors. Some of that progress is due to energy efficiency. A large amount of that progress is due to decarbonisation of the power sector. And I'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. Now that doesn't mean it will be easy to continue progress. In fact, it could be much more difficult to continue to make progress because some of the easy uh, opportunities to reduce emissions, maybe they've already been um, taken, but we can come back to uh, we can come back to that. And I should say that although the UK has obligations as it, as a result of being a member of the European, Union. The Climate Change Act is domestic legislation, has nothing to do with the EU and nothing to do with Brexit. Okay, so luckily, despite Brexit, we can talk about Brexit if you want to, um, then uh, this, 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 this is still uh, binding legislation. Another piece of very, very important context. So what I have on the slide here, these are for offshore wind costs. Uh, in pounds per megawatt hour, so if you want to do a conversion in your head, it's not that different anymore from a dollar. Okay, we can come back to that. It's also because of Brexit, but that's another story. And these were the prices that were being paid to renewables projects in Britain uh, four years ago. Uh, offshore wind projects, sorry, specifically offshore wind projects. And then we introduced a, a system of competitive tenders to allocate the, the prices. And so then we see these were the first round of competitive tenders, and these were the most recent round, uh, bid prices uh, for construction of offshore wind projects. 
Now those are the costs of generating electricity from that plant. Those costs include some element of grid connection because the offshore wind developer has to pay for the connection to the shore, but they don't include all of the other potential costs on the system from in, in, incorporating renewables. But when you start getting down to about here, you start getting quite close to what we call grid parity. And grid parity is when the electricity cost from renewables is very similar to the cost of wholesale electricity prices. And in many markets around the world now, we're seeing big prices for, the re for renewables, for example, large-scale solar schemes in some countries, wind in uh, other parts of the world, uh, being bid at the same price or below that of uh, fossil fuels. And by comparison, um, in the UK we now have a, uh, a deal in place to build a new nuclear power station. That new nuclear power station will be paid £92.50 per megawatt hour. So it looks as if, on this basis, renewables are getting towards half the cost of, of, of nuclear. Now, nuclear is baseload, nuclear is always reliable, renewables are variable, renewables are intermittent, and so how much does that, does that, does that change the, the context and how much does that picture change when you factor those in? Well, those are exactly the questions that we're, we're trying to answer with, uh, with, uh, with this report. Um, another piece of important context is just to think about the level of penetration of renewables. Because in, uh, you can see here the, the yellow line is uh, Germany and the, and the blue line is the, the UK. And it shows uh, installed capacity in gigawatts and it shows electrical energy output in, uh, in uh, well it actually is a percentage, uh, so that would be terrible hours per year, but it's as a percentage of, of the total. And as you can see, the Germans have a very, very high installed capacity of variable renewables. It's equivalent actually to, um, very similar to their installed capacity of conventional generation. And the reason it's so high, or one reason it's so high, is there's a very large installed capacity of solar. There's lots of wind as well. But as you can see, with a much lower installed capacity, the UK is up to a similar, or, or a, a, a relatively uh, small similar share of electrical energy. And that's because, well obviously, um, German, Germany uses more electricity than the UK. Uh, it's also because the UK does not have such a high, although it has grown such a high penetration of solar, and has a relatively high, highly productive uh, fleet of offshore wind and onshore wind farms in windy locations, like Scotland, where it's very windy. So this difference between these and these is a function of load factor, and so that's important as well. So you need to think about and understand these kind of contextual factors. Um, and we're seeing this across the world, okay? It's not just Britain, it's not just Germany. Uh, there's a whole bunch of countries that are getting to uh, certainly above 10% from wind. And in the case of some countries like Ireland, Ireland and Denmark, it's above 20% of electricity from wind. And I was doing my research on the plane, as you do, uh, and I was reading the report from the Confederation of Electricity Generators, and I believe that there's an objective in Japan to have 20 to 25% of electricity from variable renewables. Uh, I can't remember the date, uh, maybe 2030. Um, so that it's kind of a quite widely shared aspiration to grow, the, to grow these renewables. But obviously there are some people in the debate uh, colleagues, for example, at Stanford, who argue in, in their analysis we could have 100% renewables. I think that's a very big stretch, but anyway, it's growing around the world. And so, um, one of the things which is really interesting when you start to try and look at this in more detail, so we've got here um, the growth rate. This is just um, seven years worth of data. So what we've seen in the UK is a very, very rapid increase in the share of, of uh, wind, solar and other renewables. And uh, as a result, so what I was going to do is I was going to click this link, but I'm told this, the, the laptop's not connected to the, connected to the internet. 
But if you're interested in exploring these kinds of data, um, my colleagues and I at Imperial, Colleague, uh, Imperial College, with support from a power generator called Drax, actually Drax owns the biggest coal-fired power station in the UK, uh, but it's been converted to biomass. If you go and Google that later or click that later, you can play around with data that we've taken from the market, the electricity market, that shows the share of renewables on the, on the grid in real time. And we also produce some reports around that. Because this is a very rapidly changing world or country. And so what we have here is a snapshot from uh, the summer of last year. And during that period of, um, that you can see there of about one week, you can see um, that's a, a relatively low level of electricity demand because it was the summer. We don't have a big air conditioning demand in the UK. It was windy and it was sunny. And so you can see, this is, this is nuclear on base load, this is biomass. This is what we were doing with our imports and exports to France. And uh, this is wind, this is solar, this is gas. And this tiny little bit here is coal. And if you were to draw that same graph uh, in 2010, these would hardly exist. And coal and gas might reverse their positions on the... So coal could be here. And all of these changes are because of policies in the UK over a relatively short space of time. So I'm very happy to talk about those policies and how they've driven this kind of transition. <coughs> um, but I'm going to focus a bit on some of the cost questions associated with that. Certainly what we've been very su successful at in the UK is reducing emissions of CO2 from the power sector. Uh, so this is 2012. Uh, the, this is um, uh, uh, emissions intensity per kilowatt hour of electricity. This big grey box here is the emissions from coal. And this is five years later. And this narrow little slither is the emissions from coal. And this is the, uh, what we're getting from gas. This is what we're getting from the other renewables. So it's a change to the electricity mix that has had profound impacts on carbon emissions. And I think if you're in a conversation, a global conversation, which you guys are in, about what's possible and what's achievable, then it's possible to say we can absolutely decarbonise electricity in a relatively short space of time, which doesn't mean we, there aren't challenges to go further. So this is how much coal we, were, but we have burnt. This is how much renewable electricity we have, uh, is, have got. And this is carbon intensity. So interesting stuff. So the question really is, Looking at this picture, is this a power system operator's nightmare? Is this an electrical engineer's nightmare? Is this going to cost a, ter a fortune? Uh, or is this uh, a relatively simple problem to solve? And to the extent to which this is a problem, I'm an economist, okay? I'm an economist who pretends sometimes to be an engineer, not to engineers. Um, but I'm a, I come at this as a pragmatic, uh, solutions-focused, primarily technical person. And the question that we want to try and, I'd like to try and talk to you about this afternoon is how much of a problem this is and how much does it cost to fix. Okay? Okay, so that was part one. Part two of three is the UK review and what we did. Um, so what, we, the, what my team does, so when we, when we produce um, reports like these, uh, we do systematic reviews. Uh, now, systematic, systematic review is a concept of uh, evidence-based policy, evidence-based policy and practice. It originated in the medical arena, because in the medical field, um, they have drugs. The drugs go into field trials. Field trials can take place in, in different parts of the world. And systematically, over several decades, the medics have been doing meta-analysis of all of the data and all of the reports and studies. And then that's spread into social policy and education policy and other areas. And I have to say that we're still quite bad at it in energy. Like we don't necessarily um, take advantage of the 
information that's already available. So instead of taking advantage of the studies that have already been done, we do a new study. We come up with a new approach. We tell a funding agency that we need to build a new, really complicated model. Now, my, we're guilty of doing that too, okay? But what we also want to do is to try and see what's in the data and see what's in the literature. So that's how we go about doing um, uh, uh, this report. And the other thing that we try and do is we try and make sure that we can reach an audience with these reports. So not just speak to other academics. It's really important to get other academics involved. So we have experts, for example, on this report we had experts from the States, uh, from Finland, and from other parts of the world, academic professors of, uh, of electrical engineering to inform the report. Um, but we also want to make sure that the policymakers are listening. Because one thing that academics sometimes do is they write uh, a report or a paper and they kind of wave it around like that and then they just throw it away and they hope that somebody in government has, has taken attention. So what we did was we actually got government on the steering group for the project to try and get their engagement. But the context in Japan is somewhat different but I still think that this is an approach that's worth trying uh, to, uh, to, uh, to follow. Okay, so uh, this was the 2006 findings. So uh, what we found is most reports did not consider renewables above 20% of energy on the system because we were drawing on an evidence base that was going back into the, well, in some cases to the 1970s, but certainly in the 1990s. And because renewables were starting from a low base, everybody thought 20% was very uh, ambitious for renewables. We found that there were two main categories of cost reported in the uh, literature, uh, and I will explain what both of those uh, categories of cost are. I'll explain what they mean. System balancing and uh, maintaining reliability. And as you can see, those costs in pounds per megawatt hour look quite small. So a few slides ago, I showed you the levelized costs of offshore wind. And I showed you that back in 2013, it was 150 pounds per megawatt hour. It's now fallen to about 60 pounds. And a really cheap uh, solar, I've seen some solar projects that have been built in Mexico, for example, that come in at about $50, okay? So we were talking about a combined price there of about $10 US. So at that time, it looked as if the intermittency costs were quite small. So the costs of balancing the system were quite modest. And there's a bunch of other impacts that I'll come back to. Um, so the obvious stuff, just you know, what we're talking about here. There's a, there is a semantic debate. Some people don't like the word intermittency. They say nuclear power stations are intermittent because if they all go on a fault, they all go off at the same time. That's really intermittent. And it's usually windy somewhere, so that's not intermittent, so we should call it variable, or we should call it something else. Fine, okay. Uh, let's call it variable. But uh, intermittent is quite widely used as a term. And although there's lots of sources of renewable power, um, the two that have become the fastest growing are wind and solar. So when we want to in investigate these phenomena, we want to investigate the impacts of wind and solar. That's what we looked at. Okay, there are others. We're not looking at everything in this study. And the other thing to, 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 to say, um, at the risk again of saying obvious things, is that uh, electricity demand is not flat. So these are the profiles from Britain for electricity demand before we started to have a large share of renewables in the system. So this is data from 2003, and it shows how the, uh, the, the demand varies during the day and during the year, and it shows that the system already has to cope with quite a large amount of variability because demand is varied. And I had, a, I had a look for some data on the Japanese system. I couldn't find data for the whole of Japan. I could find uh, uh, data from TEPCO for, for, for Tokyo, and it's a slightly different shape, but it's not that different. Okay, there's a morning peak and there's an afternoon peak, 
and more demand in the summer here because of air conditioning. Now, we could now look at a different graph which shows how this might have changed net of uh, wind and solar on a particular day. And we can see, for example, in the summer that uh, this might uh, shape like that now as the solar footprint is seen. But it's important to keep this in mind because this is uh, the uh, ability of the system to manage demand flexibility. And it's important to keep this in mind because this is the ability of the system to meet peak demand. And that's going to be true for any, any power system anywhere in the world. It's just that this might be at a different time of the day and a different time of the year. Okay. So the first thing that you need to think about if you're trying to understand renewables integration is uh, system balancing. And what system balancing means is uh, this is nothing to do with uh, the peak demand. This is to do with every day of the year, every hour of the day, all of the time. You have to ensure that the system balances in real time. The very little storage on most electricity systems. Electricity systems are alternating current. You have to maintain the frequency within narrow limits. Otherwise, there's problems, engineering problems in the system. Different markets have different ways of, of, of organizing how electricity is made to match demand. The UK market is very liberalized. Almost something like 98% of the power on the market electricity supplied is done through trades between private companies. But the system operator, National Grid, has a responsibility for uh, ensuring that the power supply matches demand are instantaneously at all time. It does that partly through actions in the market. But one of the ways that it does that is, it, it, is that it, it contracts for short-term operating reserves of various forms. System operation reserves. There's lots of terminology. It differs across countries. But I think you understand the basic. I hope is the, the basic premise is quite straightforward. That you need a system operator. The system operator needs to be able to go, you need to turn up your power very, very quickly. Some of these, some of these uh, reserves have to be instantaneous, almost, in order to manage the system. And one of the things that the system operator makes provision for is the loss of the largest single in-feed. So the largest power station, or in the UK, uh, it's uh, the Sizewell uh, nuclear plant, uh, which is 1.2 gigawatts, individual generator, you know, not like a power station with lots of separate units, or the interconnector to, uh, interconnector to France. It has to make allowance for demand prediction errors, and it has to make uh, a, a allowance for uh, conventional plant, uh, large numbers of conventional plant going wrong. It's, it's been done since the early days of electricity networks by looking at the statistical likelihood of errors, and then you make an allowance for how much reliability you, work, you want, usually simplify things in some way, and then have an amount of reserves. Because obviously this, this is a cost. And you impose this cost on consumers, and if you commission too much reserves, your system will be very reliable, but your, your consumers will be paying for something that we don't need. So the question for renewables is, how much does all, all of this change if you put a, a whole load of wind farms onto the system? That's the first question, okay? So you'd expect that they would fluctuate more. Uh, you'd, you'd expect that they would have a different distribution, probability distribution of uh, being wrong about their output from a conventional power station. Um, and you would not necessarily expect that they would all be off at once in the same way that a single power station might go wrong. And there's a question as to how predictable they are, which is important and has been changing through time. Okay, so that's one set of issues that you need to, to, to try and take account of. The second concern is making sure that you've got enough capacity to meet peak demands. Sometimes this is also rever referred to as reserve capacity. One of the problems that this uh, topic has is that words are used interchangeably to mean different things. 
And that is one of the reasons why this is a controversial topic, because this type of reserve is actually different from the previous type of reserves. Now, historically, many power systems have, have managed a kind of quite generous capacity margin in order to ensure that they can meet peak demands. They're not sure when they build the capacity how reliable it will be, whether it will be available at a certain time of the year and so on. And in some countries, including the UK, this has become a concern and as a result we have something called a capacity market. I won't go into the details of that, but essentially what that means is that if power stations are paid for being available even if they don't provide electricity. And we could have a seminar on electricity market design and electricity market economics and is that a good thing, but that's not today's topic. So again, the question of when we're, we're trying to understand uh, renewables integration is how much does that change if you have renewables in the system? So for example, I can tell you that if uh, in the UK, solar photovoltaics make zero contribution to system reliability if what you're concerned about is peak demand. Because peak demand in the UK occurs when it's dark, in the winter, in the evenings. Okay? But in some countries, peak demand occurs in the summer when it's sunny. And so there's a concept that's referred to as capacity credit. And capacity credit is how much you can count on a renewable generation source as being reliable. No generation source is 100% reliable, some are more reliable than others. And you, you need to think about this and, that's, and, and cost this, these factors. And there's a bunch of other concerns that, uh, are, that also appear in the literature. Okay? But the principal two that are well documented and costed are system balancing and reliability. Okay, so that's my kind of uh, beginner's guide uh, to, uh, to, this, to this subject and um, maybe try and keep some of those things in mind uh, as, I, as I take you into some of the more uh, empirical findings uh, in, in the research. So if you're going to be trying to understand the cost of integrating renewables uh, into Japan for example, uh, or into one half of Japan or into the southern uh, sort of prefectures or whatever. One of the things that is really, really important in this area is that context is everything. Because different electricity systems could have completely different uh, 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 outcomes with the same mix of renewables. And the reason for that is that its resources differ, uh, wind regimes differ, solar context differs, the balance of system plant differs, the shape of the demand curve differs, uh, the strength of the transmission capacity also differs. And on top of all of those things, how the system is operated in terms of the market design, the relationship between the system operator and the market participants and so on, those things all affect how much it costs to integrate renewables. So to give you an example, if your system uh, regulation requires that you declare your capacity 24 hours in advance, that can be a problem for wind farms. If you, your uh, regulatory environment re re requires that you declare your capacity one hour in advance, you can predict your output with much higher levels of accuracy. And that affects how much it costs. Part of the cost of uh, covering for those uh, renewables. Not all of the costs, but some of those costs. Okay. Right, so I'm just going to move uh, forward now to, to talk about the, the work that we did uh, most recently and just to show you some of the findings. Uh, and, then I'll, and then I'll conclude and we should have uh, plenty of time for questions. So the first thing to say, this is not uh, the share of the costs of different impacts from renewables. This is the the mix of data that we found. Um, and this may or may not be of interest to, uh, uh, to you guys. Um, the headline is there's a lot of data on this topic. 2,000 data points are in our report. 
Uh, that's a lot more data and a lot more effort has been put into understanding this topic than was the case in 2006, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, however, it remains the case that much of the evidence of this on this topic still comes from simulation studies. So even though we've got some countries with quite high penetrations of renewables, quite a lot of this data isn't real data in, from markets or from system operators because actually the data is quite difficult to extract. And so the system operators themselves often run simulations of markets in order to, if you like, reverse, uh, reverse engineer the cost data that isn't really revealed to them. So that's important, maybe something to come back to. Um, now the other thing to say is, it's probably obvious, but I'll say it anyway, this is not a simple problem to solve. And so the evidence base has become increasingly dominated by really quite complicated electricity system simulation models or electricity market models. And um, it's a bit like that kid's game, I don't know how this translates into Chinese, but it's called whack-a-mole. So you're trying to, and the thing keeps popping up somewhere else. So if you squeeze down this cost, another cost comes back up again. So, so in order to represent renewables on the system, the best way to think about that is that you model system A, and system A just has like, let's say, gas and nuclear, and you work out the total cost of operating that system, economically optimized. System B, let's say, has lots of wind farms. And the cost of the wind is the difference between system A and system B. The problem with that is it's quite complicated, it's quite difficult to communicate to policymakers. And so this, it's still easier to try and explain the costs of intermittency by looking at some of these individual cap categories of cost, which I'll show some data on as we go through uh, these um, slides. But it's really, really important to keep that whole system perspective in mind, because ultimately that's the best way to try and think about and characterise this issue. Okay, so remember I said system balancing reserves it's the instantaneous uh, correction of the system up to a few hours in order to keep the system reliable. And what we can see here, so these are in 2015 pounds per megawatt hour, and the pounds per megawatt hour is not pounds per megawatt hour to the whole system, it's pounds per megawatt hour of renewable generation. Okay, so if you were thinking about that in terms of whole system costs, and renewables were at 20%, obviously, you divide that by five to get, to get you a cost per, uh, per consumer. So what we can see here, uh, so this, this graph shows in the data, uh, so I can show you this in another form in a moment, the, the range of estimates, and the, the median point is the line here. So what we see here is that at low penetrations of renewables, the costs are small, and there's not much disagreement about that. Uh, as you get to these higher penetrations, the costs become quite significant, and there's a lot of disagreement. Okay. So if you look at that, the, uh, the same data, uh, what we can see here is a clustering. So we've cut this data in a bunch of different ways in the report. So some, sometimes we cut it by geography, and sometimes we cut it by technology and you can pick some patterns from that. Um, but actually, what we have here is more real-world data from operating systems with large penetrations of renewables. And we've got a clustering of, uh, of, of real-world data and simulation studies up to about 30%. Then there's actually a paucity of data. Then all of these data points are, are drawn from a small number of studies. Most of those studies were done by some of my engineering colleagues at Imperial College. Um, there's a guy, a professor there called Goran Strabak, who does a lot of power system engineering modelling. And the range actually represents what you assume about the flexibility of the balance of, of the system. 
So if you have a very flexible system with lots of demand response, storage if it's cheap, uh, rapid gas fired uh, response, highly interconnected, you get relatively low costs. And if you assume a system that's very inflexible with a high penetration of, of nuclear, not very much demand response, you get the opposite story. Okay. Um, and this is not from our report, this is from a, a forthcoming paper by one of my colleagues. Um, but what this is looking at, what this is actually showing is that there is some evidence that this is all from Germany. Uh, this is for different categories of system balancing costs. So this is, first of all, um, as it's been opened up to more market competition, and that's the prices paid through the balancing market coming uh, down. And this one shows increasing penetration of renewables and balancing costs actually in the market in Germany coming down. So this is really, really interesting uh, comparative data because what we have here are a bunch of simulation studies that show as penetrations of renewables increase you would expect system balancing costs to go up and to become more varied. And then you have some empirical data which suggests that we can counteract the inherent increase of those costs if we get better at operating the system. Okay, um, And this is the cost of meeting peaks reliably. So what we have here is a quite different uh, view of the data set. So what we've got here is low penetrations of renewables and a very wide range of capacity costs which goes strongly negative. And what that says is renewables are reducing the system costs. And if you look behind that data, actually I'll just skip to the data that's behind it, you can see a study here which is from Greece, uh, where at low penetrations photovoltaics make a positive contribution to distribution network costs because they are very well correlated with the air conditioning peak uh, in urban areas. Uh, you've then got a, a clustering of uh, wind generated uh, uh, scenarios um, here. But we also published a paper back in 2006 which showed that there's actually a ceiling on these costs. And that's why as penetrations increase, the variance actually decreases uh, in this example. And the reason there's a ceiling on these costs is you can assume capacity credit is zero. And if capacity credit is zero, that means you can still get useful energy from your renewables, but they won't be available at peak. So something has to back them up. And then you make an assumption about what that costs, and then that gives you a cap on the, the total costs. Right, so not that many more slides. There's a, there's a, I'll skip through some of this. There's a bunch of stuff about uh, different technologies, and you can see that um, it's interesting that PV can be dominate in both the, the, the red is PV, so it can be the high contribution and the zero contribution to, to capacity. That's rather obvious, that's because of climate. Some countries it's sunny, peak demand is during sunny days, other countries not so much. Um, you can put all that, that together, you can see what might be relevant in the UK, and you can get an approximation of what the system costs of uh, integrating renewables might look like. And what we can, what we said, what we've said to policymakers is, it still looks like up to about 30% of renewables, it costs of the order of 10 pounds per megawatt hour to integrate renewables into into electricity systems. So that's not a, an insignificant cost, but it's a relatively modest cost at relatively small penetrations. And that's something that I think needs to inform your thinking and uh, the policy conversation and costs. But it also is hugely um, affected by how flexible you think the system is. And therefore new sources of flexibility such as storage, provided they're cheap enough, can be really significant. I'm not going to talk about curtailment because I'm conscious of the time. Uh, the data are still less good on some other categories of impact. Um, 
And I'm, I'm going to skip through to the end, I think, just because I'm conscious of the clock. Um, so just to run through these maybe in, a, in, a, in reverse order, uh, we need to think about this as a whole system in an analytically rigorous way. We need flexibility in the system. Policy needs to incentivize that. Um, we know there's quite a wide range of findings in the data. It's very, very context uh, specific. We also know that in the 10 years ago, we thought it, renewables were too expensive anyway. Now we don't think that anymore because the costs have come down so much. So this really matters. And this is really in the policy conversation in a lot of countries at the moment as well. Um, and it looks like it's still a relatively modest cost, at least in the UK context. Uh, and there's some interesting links for you to look at, particularly Electric Insights. I do like it. It's really neat. It's a really fun, interactive little thing to play with. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this interesting.